Hey, welcome everybody to Sunday morning. And listen, if you've ever needed encouragement, you're about ready to get it. Uh, you ever felt like your world has gone wrong? Well, we're going to see that in John chapter 4 today when it appears that everything has gone wrong. Certainly it's gone wrong for the person that we're going to meet. And we're going to go into the situation. And uh, listen, again, we're going to be greatly encouraged. Hey, before we get going there... Um, I just want to uh, let you know about a couple of things that are coming up. We are going to be in the Lake Stevens area of Washington. It's going to be absolutely terrific. It's with Eric Barger, Billy Crone, and Pablo is going to be joining us. End of Days Bible Conference in Lake Stevens, Washington. It's near Seattle. If you're up in that area, join us. You can go to HopeForOurTimes.com and you can get the information there. And then also, uh, listen, we have a Footsteps of the Apostle Paul tour that's coming up with myself and Pastor Bob Probert. Listen, this is, this is fantastic. If you've ever been to Israel and you know how the Bible comes to life, uh, when, you, when you go to Israel on a tour and you go to the places like Capernaum and Caesarea, you go to Jerusalem, Mount of Olives, everything comes to life. And when you read your Bible, you're never the same because you put yourself in that situation. You can see it. Well, this is what's going to happen when we go on our footsteps of Paul tour it's going to be absolutely terrific. Not only will you go to these places like Ephesus and Corinth and Athens, not only will you go to those places and a lot more, but also you're going to be with like-minded people. You're going to meet new people from all over the world. And uh, it's an education tour, but you're going to be blessed. It's going to be good food, good fun, and really encouraging. And I hope that you can join us. It's Bob, Pastor Bob Probert and myself. Hey, before we get going... Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity uh, to live for you, that you have saved us, that you ministered to us in this world. And Lord, as I, I, as I look and think about everything going on right now, I think of the people who are watching this, and maybe they're going through a really difficult time. Lord, I pray especially for your ministering to them as we see you in this situation as you meet us where we are. And there may be people out there right now, Lord, that are thinking, you don't care about me. Why would you go out of your way for me? I've done wrong. I've done, that. Lord, I pray that you administer especially to them. Uh, Lord, be glorified, we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. God bless you guys. Listen, we're going to be in John chapter 4 here. Oh, by the way, one more thing. Uh, we have our Mexico uh, outreach that's coming up. It's coming up July 5, 6, and 7, July 5. Uh, this year, we're going to be uh, meeting with pastors and leaders in the community and from wherever they're coming in Mexico. Please be in prayer for that. And then on Saturday, we have a prophecy conference. Uh, Pastor Brandon Holthouse will be joining me and Pastor Moises Galvin. And then on Sunday, July 7th, I'm going to stay over and do the Sunday services. Listen, we really need your prayer and we thank you for your support. And uh, also, uh, listen, if you... Uh, would like to support us and even give. Support the ministry here at Hope For Our Times. You're the remnant church, maybe, wherever you're watching throughout the world. This is your church. You're getting ministered to here. Listen, I want to give you an opportunity right now to be able to offer your tithes and offerings, and you can do that different ways here at Hope For Our Times. Uh, you can go to the website, hopeforourtimes.com. You can uh, do it right there, uh, the opportunity to be able to uh, support the work here and engage, not just only in Mexico, but in the various things that we are doing. Um, but really looking and going, you know, I thank God for the salvation that he has given me. And we look at that and we go, Jesus, I want to be a part of what you are doing as we look forward to the time because we know our citizenship is in heaven. But you can give online, hopeforourtimes.com. You can give on the app. You can also text and give that way. And you can even mail in your tithe or your offering here too. And we have all the information for you on the screen to be able to do uh, any, any of these things. And uh, listen, I want to thank you guys. God bless you. Thank you for partnering with us as we continue to look forward with the hope of the gospel. And today we are going to have a very, very hopeful message. I know you're going to be blessed by it. And again, I just want to thank you guys. Really appreciate it. Without you, can't, we, we can't do anything. There's no organization that supports us. It's, it's just uh, you guys. Thank you so much. All right, 
Let's get going. So as we left off in John chapter 4, we were with the Samaritan woman. Remember that? She was ministered to. She gets saved. She goes and she tells the people, the community, they come out. Jesus talks about the harvest. And then we, when we left off, we were told that Jesus, he stayed there two more days with the people in, uh, in the area of Samaria, ministering to them the truths of who he was. So remember the, the well? Uh, here's a picture of Jacob's well. As it looks now, this is the well where Jesus had actually met the uh, Samaritan woman. It's still there. This is courtesy, this picture is courtesy of Joel Kramer's uh, ministry. Uh, but it's still there in the area of Nablus. And then he's, he's going to be leaving there. And that's where we're going to be picking up here in just a second. Let me show you a map so we get an idea of where Jesus was and where he's going. If you look right about in the middle of your screen, you'll see uh, one of the balloons there. It's over an area called Nablus. And just about right in the middle, right above a green one and right below a blue little dot you see there. That's where Jesus was. That's where Jacob's well is. That's where the area of Shechem is. That's where Jesus met the Samaritan woman. Now he's going to leave there. He's going to go to Galilee. And you look up uh, towards the top of your screen in the middle, you'll see the Sea of Galilee. You see the, the city named Tiberias. Jesus is heading there. He's going to go up to the area of Capernaum or Capernaum, which is right there on the shores of the Sea of Galilee. And he's also going to go to Cana. So uh, let's get going there as Jesus, he has another appointment. So he had an appointment with the woman at the well, right? Remember that? That's why he went out of his way to go to Samaria because he had an appointment with that one woman and that one woman was going to share what Jesus, who Jesus was and many people were going to get saved. People, you're, you and I are going to meet when we get to heaven. That is pretty cool when you think about it. Well, today he's leaving the area of Samaria, going up to Galilee, Capernaum, and Cana specifically because he has another appointment, uh, an appointment with a man whose world has gone wrong. So you ready? Let's read John chapter 4. We pick up in verse 43, and the Bible says this. Now, after the two days, the two days he stayed in Samaria, he departed from there and he went to Galilee, for Jesus himself testified that a prophet has no honor in his own country. So when he came to Galilee, the Galileans received him, having seen all the things he did in Jerusalem at the feast, for they also had gone to the feast. Let me read a few verses further, verse 46. So Jesus came again to Cana of Galilee, where he had made the water wine, and there was a certain nobleman whose son was sick at Capernaum. All right, so we have the dots connected. The area of Galilee, we have Cana, we have Capernaum. But something very interesting uh, is said here. Verse 44, there seems to be a paradox. Verse 44 says, Jesus himself, or, or the Bible tells us, a, a prophet is not received. What's it say here? For Jesus himself testified that a prophet has no honor in his own country. It's not received in his own country. Yet in verse 45, it says, the people received Jesus having seen the miracles that he did at the feast in Jerusalem. So wait a minute. He goes up to Galilee they won't receive him there, but it says in verse 45, they did receive him. Okay, so what's going on here? Well, the, the, the feast in Jerusalem they're referring to takes us back to John chapter 2, uh, when Jesus went to Jerusalem for the time of Passover. And it's referring to the miracles that the, the people of John chapter 2 saw. Not the miracle of, uh, of Cana of Galilee, but the ones he performed in Jerusalem when Jesus would not commit himself to them because they were only following him for the miracles. So that's what's going on here. And Jesus knew it. Uh, so the Galileans were, for the most part, only following Jesus because of the miracles that he did. Yeah, they saw the miracles in Jerusalem, but they're only following him for the miracles. You think of the feasts, and we'll get to some of the or the times when Jesus fed the thousands of people. We'll come to that later on in the Gospel of John. Not today, not for a few Sundays still at least. But we think of that, and, and Jesus, in John chapter 6, when he performs this great miracle, feeds all kinds of people, thousands and thousands of people. We learn they only came there to get the free food, but when he started preaching the truth, 
They didn't want anything to do with it. People are like that today. So that's the same concept. Yeah, Jesus knew they, they followed him only because of the miracles. They didn't really want to know about him. So hence, he's, he, he has no honor in his own country. So he goes up to the area of Galilee, specifically he goes to Cana of Galilee, where he made water to wine. And there was a certain nobleman whose son was sick verse, uh, at Capernaum. Verse 47, when he heard that Jesus had come out of Judea into Galilee, he went to him and implored him to come down and heal his son, for he was sick at the point of death. Very interesting. So now we got the different connections, right? You have the picture of the Sea of Galilee. You have Capernaum up here. You have Nazareth over here. Nazareth is not on the Sea of Galilee, by the way, and, and Cana is an area just located right there adjacent to uh, the area of Nazareth. But number one, we see his return to Galilee. Number two, we see uh, uh, the reason for his return. The reason for his return, pretty simple. Again, uh, he's, he's, this noble man is from uh, Capernaum. Let me show you a picture of Capernaum so you can get an idea of what it is. Uh, this is a, just a, a sign as you're entering into the area of Capernaum or Capernaum. Um, uh, there's a picture. In fact, I just took this picture when we were there just a few weeks ago. Some of you were there with us. This is the picture. The, the two people that are there, because I've been saying nobody's there but our group. Those two people were with our group. One of them happens to be my wife. But as you look at the picture here, this is some of the dwelling places in Capernaum. And those of you who have been there, you know that that is the synagogue that is uh, stand that is right behind my wife that's there. And underneath, so you see the white uh, um, blocks that are there for the synagogue. Underneath, you see the dark black uh, blocks that are underneath the white. Those dark black blocks that are there, just that thin line, that was the original synagogue that was there during the time of Jesus. Um, just fascinating to be able to go there and, and see these things. And another reason why I say, hey, go with us if you can to um, w when we do our tour, our footsteps of the Apostle Paul, you'll be uh, really blessed by it. But Jesus, he goes to Cana of Galilee, uh, and like the woman of Samaria who he had an appointment with, he has an appointment with this man who's going to come from Capernaum, a nobleman, a, a man of of stature. He has an appointment with him. The man's going to leave Capernaum and he's going to go and meet Jesus at Galilee. What happens is the man has a great crisis. His world had suddenly gone wrong. His son was sick, sick to the point of death. All right, now, what is this? Who is this nobleman? What's this term mean? Well, nobleman comes from this Greek word that means royal official or a king's man. So that's exactly what this was. He's a royal official. He is a king's man. This man, being a nobleman, he was an official, get this, in the court of King Herod Antipas. King Herod Antipas over the area of Galilee. Fascinating. So we think of... Uh, of King Herod Antipas, he's the ruler of Galilee, who was his father. His father was Herod the Great. Who was Herod the Great? Herod the Great was a wicked king. He's the king who built the Temple Mount, the one that you currently see when you go there. He built the Temple Mount. He built the temple on top of the Temple Mount. In other words, I should say he, re, he refurbished the temple that was there, uh, Zerubbabel's temple. He refurbished that, made it magnificent. Herod the Great is the one who built uh, Masada uh, and several other places, uh, Herodian, uh, several other places. Herod's palace in Jerusalem uh, that is there by the Jaffa Gate. It's Herod the Great who built that. So this is Herod the Great's son, and this man who meets Jesus, he served that Herod, Herod Antipas, the son of Herod the Great. This is, this is pretty wild when you think of it. Herod Antipas, oh, by the way, Herod the Great is also the one who had all the little baby boys in Bethlehem killed that were two years younger because he was trying to kill Jesus. He's also the one who had, um, when we look at this with Herod uh, Antipas, Herod Antipas, the son of Herod the Great, is the one who had 
Herod, uh, uh, John the Baptist's head cut off. Herod Antipas is also the one. Check this out. He's a bad dude, like his dad. He's the one who mocked Jesus, and Jesus stayed silent before him. When Jesus, the night Jesus was betrayed by Judas, and then he's taken over to Caiaphas, and then he's sent to Pilate. Pilate says, I, I'm not going to talk to him. Send him over to Herod Antipas. Herod Antipas says, do tricks for me, and he mocks Jesus. Then he has him sent back to Pilate, right? That's this Herod Antipas. So this man, check this out. This man, this royal official, this king's man, this noble man, served in the, the administration of Herod Antipas. So he's way up there at the top. He humbles himself, and he leaves Capernaum. He had heard about Jesus. He's a Gentile. Interesting. He hears about Jesus, a Gentile, and he comes all the way to Cana because he, had, um, he cared for his son. By the way, like anybody would, right, for their own child. Anybody should. So he's a man who would have had great influence. He would have had significant power. He also would have been a man of great wealth. Verse 47 informs us that his son, however, was sick, and he was sick at the point, verse 47, to the point of death. Um, it's been said that nothing can shatter us more quickly or more completely than affliction falling upon our children. Listen, I can say this for a fact. When, my, when I'm sick, I'm sick. I'm bummed out, not feeling good, right? Um, my wife gets sick, I feel bad for her. But when your child gets, I feel worse for her than I do for me. But when your child gets sick, it kind of, it does something different to you. You really, really reach out and you really care for them, especially when they're really young. You, you're kind of like, oh, no, they're sick. I hope they're going to be okay. And, and I'm down the list. Listen, when, when, again, um, nothing can shatter us more quickly or more completely than affliction falling upon our own children. So here, regardless of wealth, regardless of education, status, popularity, and on down the list, trouble, sorrow, and death come to us all, like this, this nobleman. Wealth, power, influence, education, trouble, death, tribulation can come to us all. And here with this man, death is knocking at the door of his son and his household. And he, I want you to understand, folks, he is devastated. Some of you have lost a child, lost someone close to you. It is painful. I've been a pastor for over 25 years been in ministry for over 30 years. And I've been through some really difficult things with people. I have a friend who lost two sons, two different car accidents, tragedy. Other, just tragedy, and tragedy after tragedy in the years of ministry as I think about it. And it's devastating. And some of you have been there, and the Lord loves you, all right? And he wants to encourage you. And there's some encouraging words here, but let's get through some more facts first. All right, let's get a takeaway here. And understand this, it's a little hard to receive, but it's true. Here's the first takeaway. Everyone experiences sorrow. There are no exceptions. Um, just recently, I received a call from someone, and their, their husband just suddenly died. It was the widow maker, the heart attack. Suddenly died. A totally unexpected. She's just absolutely devastated. Listen, everyone experiences sorrow. There are no exceptions, all right? So understand that. I remember the old TV program, MASH? Uh, during the, it, was, it was about a, um, a medical unit during the time of the Korean War. Well, this statement came out in one of the episodes. It, in war, rule number one in war is that young men die. Rule number two in war is that doctors can't change rule number one. Everyone experiences sorrow. There are no exceptions. In, in the book of Job, a man well acquainted with grief who had lost children, who had lost livestock, lost business, was absolutely devastated. Job chapter 5, verses 6 and 7 says, For affliction does not come from dust, nor does trouble spring from the ground. Yet man is born to trouble as sparks fly upward. That phrase, as sparks fly upward, is conveyed with much greater depth in the Hebrew because the two words that are used for sparks are literally sons of 
flame. Man, and we can feel that way when really, really, really difficult things come upon us, sons of flame. And that's where Job was. And that's where this man is. He's looking at his son. Oh, no, my son is about to die. And number two, you, 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 I, I want to encourage you, because sometimes you're thinking, I'm going through this trial. Listen, number two, you need this. Don't cancel your appointments with Jesus. Second takeaway, don't cancel your appointments with Jesus. Be smart like this noble man was. Again, part of Herod Antipas' kingdom, part of his court, he's a noble man. And King Herod Antipas' kingdom, he's an important man. He's a man of wealth. But be smart like this noble man. Swallow your pride and give your problem to Jesus. Humble yourself. Give your problem to Jesus. Listen, think of this. There are things that money cannot buy. Think of this. Money can buy a king-sized bed, but it cannot buy sleep. Money can buy a beautiful house, but it cannot buy a home. Money can buy a companion, but it can't buy a true friend. Money can buy a church building, but it can't buy entrance into heaven. Listen, money isn't going to solve all your problems. The Lord Jesus Christ is who you need. Turn your heart to him. Turn your attention to the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the one who can grant you genuine peace, and he is the one who forgives us of our sins, and he is the one who's prepared a place for us in heaven. Listen, this world has trials and troubles, but our citizenship is in heaven. Look to the Lord Jesus Christ. This noble man, this king's man, was a man of importance and wealth, but he couldn't buy life for his son. He's in agony. His son is dying. But praise God, Jesus had an appointment with this man, and the man made sure to invite Jesus into his life. Again, you must understand who this man was, a noble man, a king's man, but he invited Jesus into his life in fact, he invited Jesus into his crises. I have a crisis, and guess what? No king of this world can solve it. My money can't solve it. My power can't solve it. My influence can't solve it. He invited Jesus into his crisis. In fact, he pursued Jesus. Interesting. The third main point is the road where Jesus meets us. Think of that. The road where Jesus meets us. Verse uh, 48, let's pick up there. Then Jesus said to the nobleman, the king's man, unless you people see signs and wonders, you will by no means believe. Wow, that sounds kind of strong, but let's work through this. The nobleman said to Jesus, sir, come down before my child dies. Jesus said to him, go your way, your son lives. So the man believed the word that Jesus spoke to him, and he went his way. And as he was now going down, his servants met him and told him, saying, Your son lives. Check that out. And then he inquired of his servants the hour when he got better, and they said to him, Yesterday at the seventh hour, the fever left him. So the father knew that it was at the same hour in which Jesus said to him, your son lives, and he himself believed in his whole household. Wow, this again is the second sign Jesus did when he had come out of Judea into Galilee. By the way, if you look at it that way, the first two miracles recorded in the Gospel of John were both connected with Cana. Cana where he turned water into wine, and then this time he's back in Cana, and the noble man meets him there, and he heals him at his word. All right. So after, let's get back to this. After Jesus presses the man on looking for a sign, notice in verse 49 that he implores Jesus with his even greater struggle. When he first approached Jesus, he asked him to heal his son. In verse 49, again, the noble man said to him, Sir, come down before my child Die. So first he says, son, now my child. So two different words. What's going on here? 
Son in verse 47, child in verse 49. Well, son in verse 47 means son of man. He's, he's, he's like, my son is 22 years old, right? So my son is dying. I don't know how old this man's son was, but in verse 49, he uses the term child. Now he says little boy. He, he recognized, look, he's, he's, he's begging with Jesus over and over again with a broken heart. My child, my little baby who I once rocked in my arms is dying. So whether your son is 10 or 15 or 20 or 30 or 40, my mom's 93 years old. She still looks at me as her baby boy. I'm not a baby boy. I'm six, almost 65 years old. But that's a parent's heart, right? You look, he's my son. Who's son. Again, we don't know how old his son is, but now he's, he's a child. He's my child, the one I rocked in my arms. You can hear his heart. And, and notice how the man told Jesus, hey, he said, come to Capernaum. Come to Capernaum. But Jesus didn't go, and he didn't have to. Jesus isn't challenged by distance or separation. He simply says, hey, here's the deal. Go your way. Your son lives. Didn't have to go to him. Sometimes he chose to go. This time he chose, I don't need to go there. I'm not challenged by distance or separation. He spoke his word, and the man's son was healed. The application of this story today our own experience is clear and it's encouraging, which takes us to our third takeaway. Here it is. Ready? Third takeaway. Second is don't cancel your appointments with Jesus. Third, God allows what he hates in order to accomplish what he loves. He hates sin. He hates death. But Jesus came to accomplish what he loves, right? In this sense, we have death coming but God allows what he hates in order to accomplish what he loves. And this speaks to every aspect of life. If you think again, verses 51 and 52, when did this happen? His, his servants meet him on the road. When did this happen? So he's making his way back to Capernaum. He's on his way back. When did it happen? Well, it happened about the seventh hour. That would be about one o'clock in the afternoon yesterday. This is, he, he was healed. From Canaan to Capernaum was only about a four-hour trip. The nobleman could have been there by five o'clock. But it appears that after he believed Jesus' word, he really believed it. He told me my son's healed. He could have gone, well, he, he believed Jesus. He had, he had like no reservation. He had no doubt. Therefore, he stayed the rest of that day and quite possible, as many teachers point out, that his faith had grown tremendously and he stayed behind believing his son was healed and listened as Jesus continued ministering and teaching the others who came to him in Cana. Let me tell you something. I believe he had this radical spiritual awakening on faith when Jesus told him, your son lives. He, he just overwhelmed him and he knew it. He didn't have to worry about it. So he didn't have to rush home and he, uh, right there, right at that moment. Um, I, listen, I, I'd like to think that you have had prayers like that that have been answered. I had one just the other day. I, I prayed and immediately the prayer was answered and I knew it was from the Lord. I, I, I absolutely knew it was. It, it was. it was really one of those moments like, wow. I mean, it's like I prayed and, and boom, it was, it, was, it was there. I've had that a couple of times lately. And, and where God is ministering, and you know it's him. You go, I don't have to worry about this anymore. God's got this. I'm good. Ten minutes before, you're all worried. You're, you're, you're freaking out. And all of a sudden, you are good and you know it. And people go, I thought you were up. Everything's good. God has this. This is life and death situation about his own son. This is incredible. From where he was in Capernaum, coming to Cana, looking for Jesus, finds him. My son's going to die. You got to come to him. So all of a sudden, he's healed. Oh. Believe it, I know it, it's true. Verse 53 again. So the father knew that it was at the same hour in which Jesus said to him, your son lives, and he himself believed, and his whole household. This to me becomes even more interesting. I'm going to show you something. To me, this is kind of off the charts. You ready? I mean, this is totally cool. Okay, if you have a Bible with you, turn over to the Gospel of Luke. I'm going to show you just three verses and one comment, because everything starts to fall in place right here. So check this out. Luke chapter 8, verses 1 through 3. In fact, if you were with us 
in Israel just a few weeks ago when we were at Migdal or Magdala. I taught a message from here about Mary Magdalene, but I'm going to focus on something different here this time because this is totally cool, and it looks like it connects with John chapter 4 in this noble man and his son. Check this out. You guys ready? Luke chapter 8, verses 1 through 3. It came to pass afterward that Jesus went through every city and village talking about the area of Galilee, right? Every city and village. Preaching and bringing the glad tidings of the kingdom of God, and the twelve were with him, this twelve apostles, and certain women who had been healed of evil spirits and infirmities. Check this out. Mary called Magdalene, out of whom had come seven demons, and Joanna, the wife of Husa, Herod's steward, and Susanna and many others who provided for him from their substance. All right, I've looked at Mary Magdalene before. I want you to look at this right now just for a minute. Maybe two with me. Joanna, the wife of Husa, Herod's steward. Herod's steward, wait a minute. This Herod that's spoken over in Luke chapter 8, guess which Herod is? Herod Antipas. Guess who the nobleman worked for? Herod Antipas. Wait a minute. He's a nobleman. He's up in, he's up in the ranks in Herod Antipas' uh, administration. This Joanna here? Wow. She's married to the steward of Herod Antipas. Who's a, a nobleman, a king's man? Listen, it is quite possible. I will even say this. I'm going to go out on a limb here. We won't know it for sure until we get to heaven. I say it's not only quite possible, it's quite it's probable that who's a, and Joanna of Luke chapter 8, that Husa is the nobleman of John chapter 4, whose son was sick and died. Hence, I think about this. The, the, the nobleman goes from Capernaum. He works for Herod. He goes from Capernaum, goes to Cana. He, Cana, he seeks Jesus. Jesus says, your son is healed. The nobleman, he's dying on the inside. His wife would have been dying on the inside. Our son can't die. You can imagine it. Well, whatever happened, Joanna becomes a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, so much so that in Luke chapter 8, the wife of Herod's steward becomes a believer, so much so that she follows him with Mary Magdalene and the other women, providing out of their substance. I believe that's, that's who this was. It was, Husa is this noble man, from John chapter 4, and he would have gladly said, Joanna, take some money, give it to Jesus to provide for him, because it takes money to run ministry, right? Take some money, give it to Jesus to provide for his ministry as it continues to do great work, because this man of John chapter 4, his life was radically touched. Friends, this is remarkable. This is totally Remarkable. When you start to look at your Bible, you start to connect the different things, you go, wow, I've never seen that before. I've never seen that before. Absolutely fascinating. Wouldn't it be cool to go to Israel, connect the dots with Cana and Capernaum and Luke 8 and John chapter 4 right there in Capernaum? That's cool. All right, a couple more takeaways and then we're done. Ready? F number four, fourth takeaway. Jesus is the answer to our own anxieties as well. Let me read chapter, uh, the third takeaway first, in case you missed it. God allows what he hates in order to accomplish what he loves. Third takeaway, number four, Jesus is the answer to our own anxieties as well. Listen, since Jesus acted as he did with this noble man, and since the actions of Jesus had the effect on him the way the Bible says, then surely Jesus is the answer to your own worries, your own troubles, your own fears. We think of the book of Philippians, be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and petition, present your requests to God, and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus, the peace of God. Through all your understanding, this man, this noble man, had the understanding, my son's going to die. Listen, whatever your understanding is about whatever circumstance God wants to grant you his peace, and he is the one who wants, is the answer to your own anxieties, your own fears, your own worries as well, and you come to him and say, Lord, minister to me. 
He might want to heal you. He might want to minister to you with great peace. Listen, the people I know whose children have died, whose spouses have died, listen, Jesus still ministers to them. And in Christ Jesus, anyone in Christ is going to be reunited in heaven forever and ever. And as J. Vernon McGee used to say, hey, we are all ultimately healed, and we're going to the place where there's no more trial, no more pain, no more suffering, no more death, because the former things have passed away. Jesus is the answer to all of our problems. This man, his world had collapsed. His world had suddenly gone wrong. But he comes to Jesus, he humbled himself, and Jesus met the man who was in his great crisis. And he went on his way with the evidence that Jesus is alive. And he was a changed man. He's a changed man. I really firmly believe, of course, we won't know this for sure until we get to heaven, that this noble man is the same man, Chuzah, in Luke chapter 8. And uh, remember this, as James wrote, cast all your cares on him for he cares for you. Number five, last takeaway. You ready for this? Very last thing. These truths are for anyone that will allow Jesus into their life. Um, Jesus healed this man's son at a distance. And we, so you might think, well, Jesus, he's at a distance from me. No, Jesus is as close to you as you want him to be. You are the only one who can close the door, open the door of your heart to the Lord Jesus Christ. He himself has said, I will in no way cast out anyone who comes to me. Anyone at all who comes to me, I will not cast them out. You're the one who has the door of your heart, whether it be if you're a believer already and it's to... Uh, be open to him to come in and minister to you in your world and in your catastrophe, your crises, whatever's gone wrong, or whatever you need an answer to. You, you have the power in your heart and life to open up your door to him and to humble yourself, swallow your pride. And also when it comes to forgiveness and salvation, listen, Jesus wants to forgive you. If you don't know that when you die you're going to heaven, then you're not going to heaven. You'll be judged for your sin, and you are the one who, you're the only one who has the power to say yes to Jesus. The man in the story of John chapter 4 had to say yes to Jesus. The woman, previously a Samaritan woman, had to say yes to Jesus. The people who ran out to Jesus to hear from him had to say yes to Jesus. You have to say yes to Jesus if you want to be forgiven. And that's the only thing that stops you, is you being willing to say, Jesus, I want to be forgiven. I want to know you. I'm a sinner. To sin means to miss the mark. Listen. Ask Christ to forgive you, and he will forgive you. Pray to him now. Ask him to forgive you. In fact, I'll pray right now. You, let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your love for us and your ministering. Lord, this passage with this noble man, in your word, is so ministering, it's so strong, but it's also a reminder for us, Lord, that we need you. And I lift up everyone here right now to you who's thinking, I need you. I want you. Or cause them to come to the place of opening up their heart, that they wouldn't be stubborn and prideful, but they'd be willing to humble themselves and say, Jesus, forgive me, I'm a sinner. Or to commit them to you now in Jesus' name, amen. Listen, it's up to you. If you prayed or you want to pray, listen, send us an email. We would love to hear from you. Go to the website, hopeforourtimes.com. Click on contact and we'll get the message, right? And uh, we'd love to communicate with you. If you prayed to receive Christ, praise the Lord. We'd like to hear about that. God bless you guys. May you be encouraged. And by the way, um, uh, listen, as I look to what is coming up, fantastic. We're going to have a, a, a great time tonight. Join me tonight. Uh, we're going to be live, continuing in the book of Daniel. Or maybe by then I'll change my mind and do a prophecy update. God bless you guys. <laughs>